Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime's session on Analyze Bus Open Data Service. Um, we're going to be looking at managing data quality, um, having a bit of an introduction to, to ABODS as well, and uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Um, this session is being run by Artig on behalf of Department of Transport and ITO. Um, we are recording this and this session will be made available uh, in the next couple of days to everybody so you can uh, review to remember what was said or share it with colleagues um, and please do feel free to ask questions during the presentations we do ask that that's done using the chat and there's a team in place to um, pick up those questions and respond as we go, but we'll also uh, open it up um, towards the end for uh, a more uh, informal uh, Q&A. So, a um, bit about uh, Artig for those of you that haven't um, come across us before. We're a uh, membership body for people that are interested in public transport technology. Uh, we uh, represent and work across all sectors of uh, the uh, transport technology um, industry. So we've got everybody from uh, Department of Transport and Welsh Assembly and people like that all the way through to local authorities, bus companies, suppliers and consultants involved. Um, and we hold uh, events like this to um, help educate people on what's going on with public transport technology. We have face-to-face -face events. Uh, we also work at a technical level, developing and promoting technical standards for people to use um, and then um, helping people make the best use of them. Um, and other technical things to do with public transport, you know, making sure that people uh, are able to use them as effectively as they can. And uh, we represent the UK on a number of uh, standards bodies uh, in Europe. Um, so that's a bit about Artig. Um, you've come though to find out this afternoon about uh, the Analyze Bus Open Data Service. Um, and so I will hand over at this point to James from ITO, who's going to uh, do most of the heavy lifting uh, this lunchtime. Thanks, Tim. I, I mean, I don't know if I am going to do most of the heavy lifting. I'd really like this to be much more about um, us answering questions and, and hearing back from everyone else. But I think probably worth giving you a quick demo of ABOD. So I wonder if I can just ask people who have used ABOD in the past to raise their their little yellow team's hand just so I can understand what our kind of audience participation is like. So I think I've got one hand raised. Is there, oh there's six six hands. Seven hovering between six and seven. Okay. So um Oh, we're eight now. <laughs> um, anyway, it's not everyone. And could I also do another one for how many of you have heard of ABOD previous to this invite going out? So how many people knew what ABOD was? OK, that's most people. Mm. All right. Almost. Are we going to get to 20? OK, well, lots of people know what ABOD was, but not everyone has has used it. OK, so that's that's interesting. So in a nutshell, ABOD is um, it's an analytics platform. It's free to access for local authorities, for bus operators uh, and for um, government bodies um, in this um, sort of world. Um, and it, like any other analytics platform, um, relies on quality of data, trust in that data, and then allows you, we hope, to get um, actionable insights from that data that will allow you to improve various areas of your business or your local authority uh, and make your lives easier um, and improve 
bus services for, for the public at, at the end of the day. Um, it is a product in its infancy, I would still say, as really the, the, the rest of the extended board system is. Um, we have some challenges, we know, um, one of which is why we're here today, which is which is around data quality. And I would break data quality down into uh, two kind of, or, or, or at least trust in the data, really. I would break down into two separate components. And one of those is kind of objective data quality. Um, which has a certain amount to do with ABOD, but but as as we know, hopefully, um, ABOD is fed by BOD's data, so it, it is reliant upon um, operators and and the data they upload being being of a of a sort of level of completeness and objective quality. And the other issue, which ABOD very much has something to do with, is around transparency. So, why is the data? appearing the way it is. How do you get to that number? What does that definition mean? And is it the widely accepted definition? And why are people talking about different definitions? Are the parameters the ones that I understand? What are those parameters and various other bits that we're working on? Um, so I think those those are the components that go into having some trust in the data. And without that trust in the data, without trust in data with, a, with an analytics platform, you don't have a lot, any analytics platform. Um, and so that is the thing that we are focusing on above all else, that it is our, our kind of primary uh, mission at the moment is to increase trust in the data. And there's various ways we're, we're doing that, which I, I can go into. I'm sure I will, will be asked about it later. Um, but I think it might be useful now to just, because I'm aware that there are people who haven't used ABODs, to just give you a brief demo i'm not going to go deep into it i'm i'm hoping that you guys will request access to abod at the end of this if you just pop it in the chat um your emails and we can we can give you access to abod and you can go and explore for yourselves but um it might be worth me just um showing you a bit of what abod can do um and then really i think it's probably best to to hand it over to you guys to ask questions because really that that's why we're here um, so I'm just going to share my screen and show you ABOD. So I'm just going to move this out of the way. This is the dashboard. It's a quick insights as to what's going on and it, and it has all of the different component parts of ABOD. So your OTP metrics, vehicle counts, feed status. Um, vehicle journeys is the is the bit that people are using the most. I think it's three times more than any other um, part of ABOD um, that people are clicking on. And it's it's the one that was released um, most recently. And it allows you to dig down into individual vehicle journeys. Um, so I'm going to use one that I used yesterday when having a look at uh, when talking to Stagecoach. So I hope if anyone's here from Stagecoach, they don't mind. Um, this doesn't reflect badly at all on them it's it's fine so hopefully that will be all right just got to make sure it is no it's the wrong east midlands sorry my wi-fi might not be great today um Is that the one? So here I have one A Scunthorpe to Yaddlethorpe, um, which I can set, see in some detail. It defaults to timing points only, um, which we've we've done a bit of. Um, user interviews and found that this is this is the preferred default, but of course you can switch it to be all stops if you want. Um, you can see the scheduled versus actual departures from each stop. If you hover over, hover over the time, we give you a slightly more forensic analysis of, of the delay. For this bit here, the 2019, we just chop off the seconds. So you can see it's three minutes late. Um, we say it's Three minutes late because it was three minutes 53 so we're just removing the seconds but if you want to know 
exactly how late it was, you can hover over it. Um, some associated metrics, on-time performance metrics, um, and then of course you can zoom in on the map and see the actual GPS pings. Uh, the map is color coded as well, so you can see on time, late, early um, on the map. Um, so yeah, that's vehicle journeys. Feed monitoring is exactly what it says on the tin. You will never see this many inactive feeds. This is a global level, so this is every single feed. You'll just see your, if you're um, a local authority, you'll see the various different operators within your jurisdiction. If you're an operator, you'll only see yourself. If you're us or DFT or DVSA, you can see everyone. So um, don't worry, there are a lot of inactive feeds, but this is only because I'm allowed to see everyone. Um, we can see the active feeds now as well. Um, we're doing some improvements here around why feeds are inactive. Obviously, it's more useful to be able to tell why your feed is inactive so you can go away and do something about it. Is it your static data? Does that need updating? Is it AVL data? So what's the reason that the feed is, is unavailable and, and giving you something to do about it? On-time performance was the kind of, I guess, the, the main reason why ABLED has been developed. We're also, um, as well as punctuality, looking into um, providing um, reliability metrics, which are slightly different from punctuality, whether a bus has has run or not, rather than how um, late or early those buses were. And obviously, um, this is the thing that that um, people are measured on uh, largely. And it's the area where we've had probably the most um, concern in that ABOD often seems to look slightly different to other providers. We think that this might be something to do with parameters. So we obviously use the, the OTC parameters. Some of our um, competitors may use slightly different parameters, which, which will change the data. I'm sure we'll get questions about that later and I'll let other people talk about that, but that could be one of the reasons. We, we've uh, recently developed a tool which allows you to compare um, what your OTC P metrics will look like using different parameters for early and late, which is going to be released later this month. Um, and then, of course, you can drill down into individual operators. I don't want to pick particularly on operators and choose custom periods of time. And again, you can filter by all stops or timing points or even exclude weekends or um, various different times um, to really drill down into that data. And then you can have a look at individual services. And then the last bit I want to talk about before I hand it over to you guys is corridors, which has many different uses and obviously pinpointing areas to, to make network improvements and persuading various uh, stakeholders using data um, that this is the, the change that is going to bring, bring about the, the greatest benefit. It's, um, it's potentially a really powerful tool. Um, so this is a corridor that's been created previously. It allows you to look at um, real time, well, not this one, um, but real time speed metrics over the course of a corridor. We're looking into how we can get more granular, so not just average speeds between bus stops, which can obviously be quite far apart, but can we go down to the level of speed between individual pings, which, uh, which will allow you to see and pinpoint maybe where those delays are being caused rather than just saying it was between this bus stop and that bus stop. It's um it it's a bit more granular than that. I guess these are test accounts. You see if we create a new corridor for you. Um, so I'm just going to do one near where I live. Um, Burford three. I can either enter a stop name or a location. It's just easier to search if I don't necessarily know the name of individual bus stops. Um, I can also select from the map, so if I know geographically where the stop is, but I'm not sure exactly what it's called, I can just zoom in here and I know that that's the one I want. So I click that, that will give me my first stop in the corridor, and from there I can just carry on adding as many or as, as few stops as I like. There was a limit of 10 stops, um, we've since removed that, um, so you can now create a corridor as long as you like, well, as long as the end of the, the service pattern. Um, okay, so I'll just add this very 
short corridor. It's probably going to be quite fast because it's on a main road, but that's fine. So I've just searched for it. Uh, for three. So let's see what was happening in the last 28 days. And obviously, this is quite a lot of data that's crunching 28 days worth of GPS pings. So that's my corridor and you the eagle eyed among you would have noticed that this isn't exactly following the route. Um, this is something that we're working on, so plotting more accurate shape data. However, just want to reassure you that we're not calculating speed using this line. We, we do calculate speed using the actual route. This is just how we're plotting on the map um, currently, but that is certainly changing. And then you've got graphs and charts um, giving you breakdowns of various different metrics. So timeline for um, journey times this was, and then we can do it by speed if you like. So here's speeds and we can do it by time of day, day of the week and have a look at the distribution. And then you can drill down into individual services. So there's just one that goes on this road, Whitney to Cheltenham. So I think probably that's enough from me. Um, now it'd be great if we could hear back from you guys about any concerns you have any um ideas you have for abod and and obviously any questions you have for me or for anyone else from ito about um abod and, and i guess the larger bods ecosystem as as a whole just um just to start on there, there, James, there has been a couple of questions that have just come through on the on the chat box, which we haven't got to just yet. So I wondered if we wanted to maybe start with some of those questions first and then kind of open the floor a bit then for any other kind of feedback that we want to kind of discuss. Um, so Paul Mullins um, was asking about when selecting between time periods, what are the limits? Uh, one, in terms of going back historically, and two, the limits on the date range itself, uh, i.e. over the course of the year. So for, for that one, from the on-time performance page, um, you should be able to go back since we began uh, kind of ingesting both the scheduled data and the, the AVL, so the uh, real-time data for said operator. So you shouldn't really have any problems being able to kind of scale back to um, when, when you began collecting data. So you should be able to look at all of last year if you wanted to, for example. Uh, Tony said as well, uh, are there plans to export corridor data uh, in the way that we can do now on the on-time performance screens? It would be really nice to take it away uh, to give to colleagues in the department. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I think that's a really good one there. So um, just to get back to, to that question from Tony, sorry, I'm just making my way through the, the questions. Um, so that, that first one, Anyway, I, I, what I heard from Patrick was something around reporting and exporting. So clearly with any analytics platform, there's a, there's a need to be able to export this data and create customized reports. And if you want it in a bar chart, you can have it in a bar chart. If you want it in a pie chart, if you want it in a PDF, because ultimately this information needs to be set, disseminated and shared among stakeholders that make decisions based off data. Um, and so 100% the ability to customize report. You can already download some um, some of ABOD, not all of it, and it's it's I think only in CSV format. Yeah. But certainly that this is a huge part of our roadmap going forward, giving you the ability to get the information off ABOD in a format that works for you, and then send it around wherever you like. Yeah, so uh, there's uh, another comment from from uh, Gemma. So when creating bus corridors, it can be difficult when there are multiple bus stops at the same location. So, for example, in a town centre where there are two bus stops next to each other, is there scope to group 
these bus stops together to make it easier to draw corridors. TfL had done this for their OD surveys, thinking something like if they share the same parent ID. And I can see that there are a few um, thumbs up to, to that comment. So it looks like a few people share, share that feedback. I think at the moment, if if I'm right, James, in terms of when we do set up a corridor in in a bod, I think at the current time you have to um, there are uh, parameters that are restricting to particular stops along a corridor that's viable in the schedule data. I don't think at yep. this current time we're able to to kind of uh, I guess group a, a cluster of stops that that go through through that section. Yeah, that that is right. I mean, and and of course. As I said, this is this feature and and Abod as a whole really is in its infancy, and we rely on on you guys to to inform product development. And if this is something that's useful, then certainly we'll we'll have a look into it. Yeah, thank you, thanks for that comment, Gemma. Um, We've got a follow up and then uh, just I think on, on corridors. So Simon Reid noticed that the average speed of one corridor is 43 miles per hour. And so it might be an area to look at the, the data quality. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you'll find um, kind of, you know, examples if and when you create various corridors that, you know, always you always end up finding yourself kind of digging deeper into it. I, I to be honest I live next to that road and it that that doesn't seem like it's out it's a, it's a main road it's an A road. Oh, okay. That's it's only in London that you suffer from uh, really <laughs> low speeds absolutely everywhere. But... What's very interesting and I I can't almost believe our luck is that we've got someone from Oxfordshire council yes. here yeah. who who would obviously know that and someone else said said they use that road Taylor, every day, yeah. which is just unbelievable <laughs> chances of that. But Seems good. Like picked picked yeah. a good corridor. One of the biggest questions that I get when I'm talking to um, people that have been using date uh, ABODs is uh, they see an awful lot of uh, no data um, on the dashboards. Um, yep. So the no data figure you've got on time late, early and no data. Um, the no data is 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 higher than zero. So what can operators do to well and authorities um, help operators with to reduce that to no data? Yeah, so it's a really good question. We had had this yesterday actually with with Stagecoach and really the no data isn't necessarily that, that there's no source data it's that we haven't been able to match real time and static data and, and often it can be um that the static data hasn't been updated so the real time didn't match up with the static um lisa deals with this sort of thing day in day out so lisa do you want to maybe comment a bit on why people are seeing no data because it very often is just that the, the data hasn't been supplied or that the the data hasn't been updated yeah so a lot of the time um it's either we don't receive any gps pings in that area and that could be for a, a number of reasons so it could be due to like there's no signal or anything like that um the other common reason like james says is um, we don't have any data for either the schedules or we don't get the actual AVL data coming through. So those are the most common reasons for there being no data. But we do have obviously niche cases where it can be that we just didn't have enough GPS pings around a certain stop, which could then lead to us not being able to tell you when it arrived or departed at that stop. So obviously we don't want to give inaccurate data. So we'd rather say that we couldn't predict for that stop rather than say that it did arrive earlier or it did arrive late when we don't actually know what happened at that point. Yeah, just just the last last point on to there about, you know, kind of uh, I guess missing departures for for particular routes or or uh, operators or lines. It's um, for for us to allocate an actual so for us to allocate a, a departure time for that trip. Um, there has to be a degree of fitness or a degree of confidence in the GPS pings that we've received. And because we know that um, obviously analyzed bus open data is obviously have 
local authorities have access to it, operators have access to their data. Um, there has to be a, a level of confidence, a, a scoring, if you will, that's met um, from, from you know, our real time engine. And so there are certain parameters that we have in place. And if, you know, if the, the data doesn't meet that degree of fitness, um, then we would rather choose not to to allocate a departure time from that stop. Um, it's it, I, I guess you could say it's kind of reinforced predictions, if you will. But um, yeah, definitely we definitely want to be careful in, in the departure times that we allocate. And so um, that's probably why you would see a higher percentage of no data in analyzed bus open data, perhaps compared to some other um, internal internal systems that, that you may have access to. Um, just going back to Paul Mullins's question, um, the range of data uh, I I don't know if it was in corridors, but but generally also, um, we're we're about to limit it to thirty days um, worth of data in the platform because it just takes too long, and people are getting frustrated. It can take two or three minutes to wait for the data because it's just such a huge amount of data. So we're um, going to send you um, a little message in the app saying um, if you require more than thirty days data. Can we email you with a CSV file because it's going to save everyone time? So yeah, that's but 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 with that CSV file, there is there is no limit. I mean, we can go back as far as we've been collecting data. So uh, David Taylor, I'm extremely concerned about highlighting TC definitions for punctuality. David, could you just explain that? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand that question. Hello. <clears throat> the prop well, the problem is that bus bus operators are and end up being pretty conservative when the, the the for their scheduling and 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 the tendency is to pad out journey time. So they frankly they never never they're never early or never late. But that means that you know journeys take longer. Buses wait at timing points, and that you know it's an intrinsic problem with the traffic commissioner definition and 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 potential sanctions. Bus companies don't want the sanctions, so they schedule according to the wor the worst case scenario, not the average average day, but the the worst day. So it, it runs counter to the, um, the 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 BSIP or the national bus strategy of of trying to speed up services and make them more attractive to users. I know it's, it's not really a technical question, but it, it, it's really about the highlighting the traffic commissioner definitions with, within this program. Mm -hmm. But we, I mean, we, I guess my response to that would be we need to, we need to show where the goalposts are, because otherwise people are unclear and it causes more confusion than is necessary. And so if you if you tell everyone exactly what is meant by on time, late, early, and how that's measured, you hopefully save confusion. If you if you don't tell people where those goalposts are, they don't know and it gets really confusing and and we end up with inundated with emails about how are you measuring this? My bus was early, it was two minutes, is it one minute? Is it one and it's it's a nightmare. So you know the legislation is the legislation we can't do much about that but we can be really clear as to what that is well, well hello welcome to slower journey speeds and people and 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 you know the absolute inverse of what national policy is you know transport policy as opposed to regulation okay can i make, so, can I make a comment that you don't actually do the same calculations of the traffic commissioners do you because the traffic sorry. commissioner the calculations done by ABOD are not the same as those done by the traffic commissioner. Right. Oh, well, I wasn't that wasn't clear. Because within ABOD, you don't take into account non-recorded data, whereas traffic no, commissioner's regulations say they should be recorded as late departures. Yeah, we, you we do don't... that for good reason, but your data is not the same as the traffic commissioner's data, as they analyze as they should be analyzed it as according to their rules. Yes, so Michael, you're certainly right that our 
our punctuality metrics do not take into account the instances of no data. Whereas those traffic emitters of publishers that you will be adhering to do take that into account. Just the percentage are different for this than they will be for the traffic commissioner in theory. I think it's a case that you could only measure what you know about. You can't measure what you don't. <laughs> And, the, well, and, the, think, and if and if something isn't actually um, uh, twig uh, isn't actually recording for whatever reason, you don't know what that reason is, whether it's run or whether it's just a faulty ticket machine or something like that. So uh, I think for so it's probably fair for ABOD to only give you what it knows about. Definitely, I'm really excited about ABOD. So really positive, and I think it, it could it's got great potential. My problem is. If I now start reporting 60% punctuality reliability for all my services in Essex or operators, if I'm an operator and my punctuality reliability is 62% or whatever the average, look at look at any average, any operator, and the traffic commissioner will either impose, could, could impose fines on a local authority if the operator is not able to meet 95% or impose fines and you know, and conditions on the operator if they're not reaching 95%. And yet, I haven't seen a 95%. So, you know, we need operators and a traffic commissioner to say either re-baseline re and say 95% actually isn't achievable yet um, in the new COVID, post-COVID world. Or, you know, is this real? Is this actually what our passengers are are experiencing at the roadside and it's not we've not been achieving 80 percent 90 percent we're actually achieving 62. Yeah I, I think that's a, a great point Andrew and, and you're right I feel like <clears throat> well firstly we don't we don't want I mean we're Switzerland here we're neutral we don't we you know we're not we're not um here to sort of impose anything or or, or say anything negative about anyone Ultimately, we're we're reflecting the data that that, that has gone in to ABOD, um, and uh, sorry, into BODs, and you know, very often Lisa goes away and digs down into individual cases, and and you know, we're we're fairly confident in ABOD's um, metrics and and data. However, of course, data is open to interpretation, and there are various parameters here that 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 can move either way, and we really want to be fair and and see if there are figures that that are not aligned with other systems exactly why that is like let's really drill down and to understand why vix is saying one thing and why we're saying another and it may be that that um baselines need to be redefined in 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 light of new measurements that that may well be the case but i feel like you're right everyone needs to be aligned and people shouldn't be worrying about being penalised for being under that 95% if no one is no one is above that 95%. Michael, you've got your hand up. No, he's put it, put it down again. Sorry, I, th I think that was in error. Yeah. So as given this session is directed at uh, authorities we've got another one um that's focused largely on operators um next week um from an authority point of view what james and patrick and co should an authority be doing if they're seeing you know 60 70 percent in a bod um and they don't think that that's right what what do you need to do investigations um you know what prep work does an authority need to do to to gather you know stuff together to be able to knock on your door and go we don't think this is right or to knock on on operator's door and go what can we do about this because a bod isn't reflecting reality yeah um lisa can i bring you in on this one I was just going to quickly, quickly jump in there yep. on, on that one. And I think I think these raise all kind of questions that, that we ourselves have been asking and we've 
been hearing from local authorities and operators is ultimately about the confidence in the on-time performance and the figures that are being presented in ABOD. And um, we've worked with several local authorities over the past kind of 18 months um, investigating routes with poor performance, uh, whether they're early or late, and really kind of drilling down into the into the raw source data. And we found it to be a really useful exercise, and it's something that we're happy to engage with local authorities with uh, specifically to the process that that you might want to consider going through is taking a look at some of those operators with perhaps only 60 percent of recorded departures um, maybe look into a service that has a high percentage of early or late um, you could then go down to a more granular level and use the vehicle journeys section take a look at some particular examples of vehicle journeys that have had um, you know fairly poor on time performance take a look at the gps pings and the times that are uh, that are displayed on that vehicle journey section and see if they if they tie in whether they are appropriately displaying um you know a, a late or, or an early departure for the for the stop before or the stop after i think it sounds to me as if we need to kind of build confidence in 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 the application and and what it's what it's displaying so once you have gone through there and if you do see some discrepancies or or any kind of results that you don't think are correct or are unsure of um please pass them on to us and we're we're happy to talk over them and take a look at at, at the raw source data ourselves as well yeah thank you patrick yeah that was going to be my recommendation is um drill down as far as you can to get to an individual journey uh, and have a look at that journey and see if it is related to the data because if there's not a lot of gps pings that could obviously be part of it or you can actually see the gps pings and see like categorically that they did go past that bus stop early or they didn't go past that bus stop early or they were running late past that bus stop and um, the pings that you see on the map now should give you enough information to justify going back to the operators and saying your bus pinged at this point you were way past the stop therefore you were definitely early and all of those kind of things just see that mike yeah go on mike can i just make a comment um uh, Michael Milton Wiltshire here. I've been playing with BODs now since it came, a BODs since it came out really, and we have liaised with Patrick and Lisa on numerous anomalies that we have found. And in fairness to them, they take them on board, they do work through them, they do give feedback, and it has changed how a BOD has worked over the last 18 months. Uh, it is a lot for the better. I'm very pleased we've now got the vehicle journeys in there. That is uh, very useful to um, to be able to have. So I would encourage everybody to get in touch because you do get some feedback from them and it does help shape the product. There's still a few areas I think we're still outstanding comments on, but there always will be. Uh, it's things like departing from bus stations when buses arrive five minutes beforehand and don't ping before they leave can be recorded as a early departure. And that's the sort of thing people should be looking out for in their data. If the anomaly is like that where buses hesitate or whatever on journeys where it gets more difficult to interpret that's one thing to look at anyway i would encourage people to contact you basically you've done a good <laughs> job so far in tweaking it for things that we've brought to your attention thank you michael that's really useful and yeah um as michael says there's a lot of things that we can start when we start looking at it um you can see that maybe the ticket machine wasn't turned on until halfway through the journey so you obviously aren't getting any on-time performance in the first half of the journey you can see the ticket machine was turned off um right towards the end and it could be that the driver is just turning over to their next journey as they're driving in to the bus station because they know that's their next journey and they're running behind um so there's lots of different reasons why it can be but we can drill down into data and kind of give you a bit more insight if you need to yeah and i just to Lee's um, Lee's point here, the the automation and the um, being reviewed by humans. I think that's that's a great point, and the the success or otherwise of, of Abroad, and I, it's a it's really a, a team effort. It it you know the the more feedback we get from users who are using it and looking at things and saying not sure about this, this should be like this. It it, it makes it all better, and and 
you know, we because we can't really build it by ourselves. We need we need the feedback of of you guys who are who are using it day to day, um, to really understand how we can improve it going forwards. Um, yeah. So it I don't think it's ever going to be fully automated. We 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 you know we we know that it's so complex that currently uh, we do need humans to get involved um, more often than not. So there's a there's a question that was uh, raised uh, a bit ago by Lee about if operators are changing their block number, which could go for their date any bit of their data at short notice, is that likely to result in AVL feeds not being matched with static data? So um, if if an operator makes a change, how long does it take to be reflected in ABODs? Um, I can answer this one. So ABOD firstly matches um, on the National Operator Code, so the NOC, then it drills down to line level, then it drills down to stop level. Um, so as long as the NOCs and the line numbers are matching, so a lot of the problems we see with not matching is, say you have um, a 23A, um, it comes through as 23A in the schedule data, but in the AVL data, it'll just come through as 23. So they're not going to match up. It has to be like for like um, between the two. So your whatever you put in your timetables, you have to match it up in your AVL so that it matches in ABOD. If an operator changed schedule data in BODs today, when will you be using that data, for example? Um, it's normally the next day, isn't it, Patrick? Let yeah, me so, so, so uh, typically, when when data is is uploaded to BODs, that's that's registered by BODs in the in the late afternoon around five. I think it's either five or five thirty p.m. at six o'clock. Our 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 obviously our system will pull the data from from BODs, and we will start what's called a, a build cycle. So we'll start to regenerate that that static model of all all the various data that's published to BODs. And then we have what's called the real time restart. And so our real time systems that are, you know, the real time data matching with that static data, they that then does an application restart at about three o'clock in the morning. And so if uh, if an operator published data this afternoon, uh, we would then be using and acknowledging that data by early tomorrow morning. OK, Michael's and then Lee. No, I just don't think you this last time, Tim. <laughs> OK, <laughs> Lee then. Thanks, Michael. I think there's another hand raised as well somewhere. Uh, Lee? Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just unclear on this. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a sort of real time AVL uh, expert or by any means, really. But um, I'm just really unclear about, you know, what it takes in order for a um, an AVL Siri uh, feed to be matched with a with static data, you know, with a PTI trans exchange file. So um, uh, this has been something that I haven't really ever got to the bottom of, like exactly what needs to happen. I mean, the issue I I raised was if block number uh, block references are changed um, at short notice. Um, so schedules basically had to be changed due to sickness or buses aren't available or, or that kind of thing, or maybe some other event like a teacher strike, uh, just to be topical. Um, so my what what I'm saying is if if the operator doesn't then change all of the block references in their PTI files and re-upload the bods, if they just leave the old data with the old block references on bods, so there's that's never going to be updated because they haven't bothered to do it, which is entirely feasible, I think. Um, mm. My point is, what does it take? What is the minimum threshold for matching to occur? Because we're talking about knock not codes and we're talking about um, service uh, numbers um potentially registration uh, traffic commissioner registration numbers I don't I don't know um but do we still need that that journey the journey number to be correct and the block reference to be correct in order for matching to occur 
so 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 block block if if the block id or block reference um has been changed or or left unspecified that won't have um that won't have any any kind of determined change on whether the ve a specific vehicle journey matches um with the static data or not so um i think like lisa said there are a few um kind of critical elements that we look for in both the static and and the real time um but what we also depend on is the vehicle journey reference and so whether you uh, whether an operator has removed block id information um there will still be an output of of a vehicle journey and vehicle journey reference which it can match to as well so in answer to your question if a block id is left unchanged um but the the vehicle journey is still in or the, the vehicle journeys associated to that block are still in the schedule data, um, our system will try and try and match to it regardless of whether the block ID has been changed. Hopefully, hopefully that answers um, your question, Lee. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Could I just pick up on Andrew's question around punctuality reports? Um, so this is something that I've heard from from local authorities for a while and certainly one of the um, opportunities for ABOD going forward is to reduce the administrative burden for everyone involved. There is a lot of admin involved um, in running buses these days for, for all stakeholders, whether you're an operator or an authority or DBSA or OTC. And I think an awful lot of time and therefore money can be saved by making these kind of processes easier, faster and potentially automated at some point and rather than standing around bus stops with a stopwatch and a clipboard doing your punctuality reports and taking an awfully long time we have all of that data in ABOT um, whether it's trusted or not obviously that will take some time but essentially a punctuality report should be the click of a button and it gets sent off to DFT or even DFT or DBSA do it themselves so yes 100% these kind of things BSIPs punctuality reports all of this should be done within with enable because the data is there and it isn't particularly complicated to to collate that and send it all off. I think um, just just whilst you, you were talking then, James, I think Mike Baxter had uh, had his hand raised. I don't know if you had a, another question to ask Mike. Um, well, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was just going to make a comment. The when you were talking about block numbers missing, um, I'm sure Tim will be able to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I would have thought that that has has an effect on cross journey predictions going forward for real time systems. Right. So as long as your um, your trip number, as you might call it, is correct. Yeah. And but um, the, the thing I was going to ask, if you don't, I've, I've been away from work for some time and I've, I've not had the chance to get to grips with uh, ABODs. Um, and it may be that I've not spent any time on it, but in terms of actually getting to grips and using it and see what it can do, is there any training courses or is it just a matter of like if you just play around with it long enough, if you've got enough now, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying whether I have or I haven't, then you should be able to suss out how to use it or have I just been asleep for too long for the last <laughs> few months while I've been away from work? No. <laughs> I, I, sorry, go on. Sorry, no, go Patrick, on, Patrick, you go. OK, um, so in terms of in terms of like kind of um, providing kind of like training material and documentation, we we hoping that we can avoid that and that's that's typically just because of how kind of dynamic the application is. We're, we're uh, regularly kind of adding new features and new additions to the service. And so we're hoping, fingers crossed, um, it's fairly kind of intuitive. And I would my my recommendation would be just uh, trying to look for uh, a specific route uh, service that, that you know very well and um, going from the on time performance page of an operator down to um, a very specific journey level in the vehicle journeys um, section. I think I think those two are a good starting point. So the on time performance feature and the vehicle journey feature. Um, and I guess then what is probably takes a 
maybe takes a, a bit more of a, of a refined effort is is probably using the corridors feature. Um, so I, I just recommend using the the on time performance and the vehicle journeys uh, pages to start with. And Mike, I I just um, go a bit further in terms of product development. And and yes, you're you're certainly not the first person to to ask for um, a instruction manual um, or whatever the the digital equivalent is, or a, a sort of best practices or um, tutorials, or whatever we want to call it. And that is coming soon. It's it's a knowledge base essentially where all of the definitions are laid out, all of the parameters are laid out. Um, there'll be how to get the best out of ABOD. There'll be in time videos on how to set things up. Um, there'll be an onboarding guide. So showing you new features and showing around, showing you around the, the, the platform and, and essentially making the complicated world of analytics um, hopefully as straightforward um, and uh, self-explanatory as possible. That failing, we, we obviously have a, a support line Patrick and Lisa are always happy to to help with any questions. Um, hit support at etoworld.com, I think. I'll put it in the chat. So it, as well, if you if you want to register for access to ABOD, please do get in touch with us on that email address um, and we'll be happy to, to set you up with an account. OK, thanks. Yeah, I have got access, but I've not had a, 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 an opportunity to 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 get to grips with it yet. Um, but the thing that for, uh, that possibly put me off was when I looked at the um, the feed, the the so, certain feeds seem to have been inactive for 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 ages, like for Centibus. I don't know whether they're down or not, but uh, it, it's it, it's something I need to look at and spend some time on. Yeah. Um. Whilst um James and Co are working on their um videos and um and uh, documentation for want of a better word um one of the things that i was going to plug um at towards the end um was um and it's probably a good place is that um over the last few years we've run a number of sessions with ito um introducing new features uh, as they've been added and doing introductory sessions and things like that they've all been uh recorded um and uh there is a page on the rtig website um rtig.org.uk slash abod um where you've got links to them all uh, and they're all freely available on youtube and so um until that more structured uh, work is done. That's the uh, probably the closest thing that you've got to a set of training videos. Uh, there's quite a lot of repetition. Um, once you watch one and been through the how it gathers all the data, then uh, you can skip over the same bits on 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 each of them. But uh, but the the there is new stuff in each of them. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. OK, so we've got five minutes left. So uh, final questions, I think, or things to pick up. There's been a sudden flurry of activity in the chat. So. Tucha or is it Tuka? Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, there was also a question you asked, a, a, a really interesting one. Tuka, hi, a really Tucha. interesting one. Tucha, sorry. <laughs> a really interesting one about um, if you're not getting any signal with your ABL. Um, we ha we've had this question if you live in a rural area or, or whatever, and, and there's a period of time where you're not able to transmit GPS ping. I believe that for most ticketing machines, they will download all of that data when they when they do find signal. Um, Lisa and Patrick, I don't know if you can talk more about what happens if you're in a in a very rural area that you've got no connection with your GPS machine and how that affects the data that's the AVL data that's being uploaded to BODs. Yeah, this is this is one of the one of the discussions that, that we've that we'd had with 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 Michael and, and Phil and we've had it with um with other local authorities as well about um you know kind of spots of spots of low signal where GPS pings aren't being sent. And I guess in 
I guess to give a short answer is when when that does occur and there is a bus that regularly goes through an area of, of low or poor signal that doesn't send out GPS pings, then uh, we wouldn't be able to report uh, on time performance for for that for that area. Unfortunately, we can only we can only provide um, analytics on on obviously services or, or trips that we that we're receiving real time and scheduled data for. And then the other one was how feasible it could be to export BOD's real-time data to feed the real-time passenger information signs on the bus stop. Lisa, you're nodding. <laughs> Um, so that, that's one of the things that we offer as Eto World. So it's a quite a complex thing. It's not an easy thing that people can just do. Um, they, you have to have a lot of um, prediction engines and stuff in the background so that you get predictions um, on the on-screen signage. So mm -hmm. it's not a simple just extract it and display it, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and again, that kind of ties in with what, what Mike was mentioning about real time systems that utilize block IDs for cross journey predictions to kind of ensure the accuracy of that information. So um, unfortunately, wouldn't be able to do that with the with the setup that we have for ABOD, um, but it is something that, that ITO do do as a, as a separate service. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I can just see Steve, uh, Steve, your hand's been raised for a little while. Hi, um, I'm Hi. from a local lo local authority along the south coast, and we have some peculiar arrangements that might contribute to the operators not having a lot of confidence in the bot, uh, bot ABOD's um, data sets. And our own planners um, have expressed some reservations about um, using BODs for certain things. Now, one of the peculiarities that I'm uh, sometimes supporting is users reporting that a bus service doesn't show up at all um, but uh, when I go to investigate it with the operator, the operator says, oh, the bus service ran the other way. And you might say, what's, what's going on there? Well, it's because near the coast, there are routes that go down to the coast, maybe through a village or a beach or something like that. And they do a circuit there and then they come back again, much on the same uh, uh, route as they went down. Um, and they might be numbered the same in both directions, or they might be numbered, depending on how big the circuit is, um, differently. So there are 51 going down and there are 52 going the other way, um, going also going down, but going around the circuit the other way um, because of the circuit is so large. And now on occasions and particularly during summer events, the one of those directions becomes clogged up uh, with uh, vehicular traffic. So lots of cars go down there for, to take people to the beach. And so the bus company sort of supports its drivers saying we'll take the other route halfway down the route it, you know the driver gets halfway there um, let's say five miles down the track and runs into the tail end of a queue going into a car park near the beach somewhere and the uh, the driver makes a it seems to be reports into his base and says right I can't go any further on this I'm going to be stuck here for I don't know how long and so he changes the, or somebody authorizes him to change the route to being 52 from being 51. And then the people that are waiting at the bus stops in one direction see the bus go past, but it's going on the other side of the road going the other way. And so they miss their bus and they get completely pissed off and tell me about it. So that's that's my function is to pick up those sort of things and try and yeah. get to a resolution. Now I'm just wondering whether First of all, can ABODs detect that sort of thing if the operations people at the bus company don't actually type in that the bus has changed route number? And uh, secondly, uh, what can you, you suggest um, we do about the data that might come out at the other end when we do reporting? Um, because it would appear that the bus, that particular journey didn't run successfully or didn't run the whole way, and then another journey was taken up and all that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm not familiar with the underlying data. so. Um, Tell me, tell me what you think of that scenario. It happens quite a lot, I have to say, during the summer. I think it's a really good example, and um, I'd like to find out more about it as well, Steve. If 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 you're available to talk about it um, later on uh, via our our support email, I think. For it, it sounds as though the number of examples that you'd be able to collect from the vehicle journeys page, you will definitely be able to see um, some examples of, you know, 
obviously certain vehicles having to go off route but that as you i think as you were alluding to does totally depend on the information that's being inputted by the driver if they're not updating their ticket machine with the um journey that they are running uh, then they probably will be some difficulties extracting uh, useful data for for it so i it does depend on driver behavior as well unfortunately right I think Paul, Paul's, I know we're just about to end, but I just wanted to finish on Paul's question. Sorry, Tim, if we've got time. Um, Stagecoach again asked about this, and, and I'm not sure how bus times are getting the patronage information when it's not widely available or of a particularly high quality. Maybe they just give you a, a, a number of seats that are on the bus, but I don't know how they're telling who's got on and who's got off, so how many seats there are left at any particular time. I mean, we could certainly tell you how many seats are on the bus to start with. We can't be accurate at all about how many seats are available at any given time because we don't know how many people are on the bus at that particular time. We'd love to know. It, it would be amazing data for so many reasons, but we just don't have it. Yeah, and uh, so some operators do provide um occupancy data um in their feeds to bods uh go ahead group being the most notable of them um but uh there's uh certainly uh you know it's a small proportion um and uh the department of transport is aware of this and wants to encourage operators to provide it but um it's quite challenging um to uh to to be honest but um we are out of time um it is just gone two o'clock so i'd like to thank uh james patrick and lisa for um your support um and um your responses and uh, the conversations and i'd like to thank everybody for coming along especially those that have um asked questions um we hope that you have um learnt something this afternoon um and um please do get in touch with uh with ito um the support address is in the chat in a number of places now um and um yeah we've got some more sessions running this month we've got one next week that's targeted at operators um and um other ones later which uh, as authorities you might be interested in about um using it for uh, for bsops and enhanced partnerships um so uh, please do uh, join us in another session and thank you everybody for your time this afternoon thank you for watching this artig webinar to find out more about artig and our work then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.